Uh, I'm a program manager from Microsoft, work in BizTalk team. And today, uh, we'll talk about AI or enterprise application integration. So we have seen a bunch of sessions in the morning. Uh, Alok talked about uh, BPM, business process management. Uh, I'm going to cover about AI today. And these are, the, these are the topics I'm going to cover. So we'll look at the scenarios and the concepts around AI. Then some of the capabilities around mediation that Alok talked about, some connectors, and then some of the message exchange patterns, All right? So let's start off. So EAI is all about integrating different systems in an enterprise, right? A typical enterprise, you see a lot of systems. You have your CR systems, you have your payroll, ERPs, databases, file server, mail server, and then we have a lot of applications which are based on cloud, all the SaaS applications, enterprise that's talking those applications. So, so we have a lot of systems. So how do you integrate all those different systems? It's all about AI. And there are a few key capabilities that you need for doing those integrations. Do you have a workflow which will orchestrate how we do the integration? There could be business process that you want to run as we integrate those different systems. You have a key component called a mediation, which is your different systems from different messages, different types of system, uh, different type of data, data formats are different. So you get a way to sort of normalize those data formats and those are mediation capabilities that we look at. And of course you need a lot of connectors, right? Because there are a lot of systems, you need connectivity to those systems, right? So before lunch, we had a session on workflow as part of the business process management. Today in this session, I'm going to cover about mediation and connectors. Okay. Uh, so how many of you have seen this slide before? Good. Because I just picked up the same slide from the seminar last year. Okay. So when you go to Vistar service, you see a messaging entity called Umbrex. And we said that is the that is the building blocks for when you do AI, right? And it has three parts, sources, which define where the message comes from. You have a pipeline in between where you do the message processing. And there you can find all the mediation capabilities like validation, enrichment extract, transform. And you have the destinations where you want to send those messages out, right? So in the new platform, in the new app platform, one of the big feedback that you have is, OK, Brisk is a good template. But the functionality in terms of customizing the template is not limited. Okay, so that goes away. And what we have is we have a workflow. And we have seen the power of the workflow in, in the previous session. I will talk about the different patterns that you can, that you can achieve using workflows. So you, you talk about a serial convoy, parallel convoy, scatter gather, all the different patterns that you talked about. And we also said, that the building blocks in the new application platform are microservices, right? So what we now have is each of those components in the bridges, they, they are available as microservices. So the sources are available as connector microservices. The destination, i.e. the document external system, they are available as connector microservices. And the pipeline that we have, which was providing the mediation capabilities, we provide individual or a set of microservices through which you can achieve the same thing. So we said sources, they are connected to microservices, right? But the sources is all about getting data from an external system. So in the workflow terminology, we call them as triggers that will kick off and instantiate a workflow. So an example would be you have the files coming to an FTP server, you want to retrieve the files and you want to start processing, you want to start integration. That is an example. You have some messages in a service bus queue. Right? Those are different examples. You could have you could have some data in your SAP system. SAP has processed the invoice and you want to send it out. Right? Those are different examples of sources. So those becomes connection triggers. The pipeline can they have provided a set of uh, mediation microservices and we'll cover in detail about each of those things. And the destinations are again connector of actions. So you you have a connector microservices that will have a set of actions that you want to perform. So all of them, the 
different models and as estimations. So let's now look at what mediations are and what we provide. So there's set of mediation capabilities. So, so in any enterprise, when you talk about integrating two different systems, you need to have some mediation capabilities, right? Because the data formats could be different, you want to do some validation, transform, enrichment, batching, all these are mediation capabilities because systems talk differently, right? They talk different languages, the data <coughs> format is different. So the mediation capabilities allow you to normalize those data and then integrate into two systems. So before we look into the mediation uh, system in D, uh, why don't we go ahead and just look at the demo? Right. So I'm asking my friends to come on the stage. Hello guys, I'm here. So I'm going to go use the traditional way of actually dragging or dropping a file onto an FTP share, which gets pulled out, and it's going to be in flat file form so that it gets decoded into XML, goes through validation stage to make sure that it conforms to the XML schema, transforms so that it can get uh, pulled into the Azure storage table. Right. So this is the kind of overview of what scenario I'm going to demonstrate. And one thing that I'm going to do is, I'm going to create this workflow on the fly. I'm going to pray the demo gods to kind of help me doing, do this on the fly. So I'm going to create a custom workflow. So. I want to call it as Integrate Summit 2014 Demo. As I had shown you earlier, the first trigger that I'm going to use is FTP file adder. I'm going to provide the folder path from which the file is going to get picked up. Integrate 2014. Right? If you notice here, I didn't give any details around the FTP server name or the auth credentials and stuff. That's because I've already deployed the microservice, which is an FTP microservice, with all this information as its configuration. So when I come to workflow, I'm just, as a business analyst, I'm just kind of pulling all the data and creating a workflow. But the individual microservice and its configuration, I've already deployed them. So the connection properties for the FTP server is already deployed and is available when I'm composing the workflow. You could choose to provide them right here, but in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to use all the microservices that are already pre-deployed. Right? In this case, I'm going to configure this workflow to say, hey, go pick up the file from this particular folder on the FTP share. Right? The next thing that I'm going to do is flat file decode. And for the input for the flat file decode is whatever the triggers output is. The third action that I'm going to select is validate. Here I'm going to select okay, the output of flat file decode, which would be in XML. So what flat file decode is going to do is convert the flat file format to XML. And my XML validate is going to validate against the already configured XML schema. Let me quickly do a transformation. So XML transform, so I've here, this is where I'm selecting a map. Since I've already configured the microservice with the map, it actually shows down in a list of maps that I've already configured on the microservice. So I'm selecting this particular map. The last thing that I want to do is send the data to Azure table. And the input for that is whatever is a transformed output. Right? So let me go on. Uh, deploy this particular workflow. <coughs> so this is where I'm going to copy the file onto my FTP share. Hopefully it's copied in a minute. All right. 
So I configured my FTP trigger to poll every minute, look for the particular FTP folder to see if there's a new file, get picked up, go through the decode stage, convert that flat file into XML, and my validation is going to validate if that XML conforms to the XML schema that I've configured on the microservice. And XML transformation is going to take the XML data and converts that into the form that I want when I'm actually inserting into the storage. So all of this is already pre-configured and I've actually created this pipeline that you're already familiar with on the fly. Now think of it this, think of it that a bunch of these pipelines are already available as templates, so it's kind of you can go quickly configure and then deploy. More importantly, you can build your own pipelines and you can put your custom code like as another microservice in between. So that's a flexibility with this new integrated platform. It's not like a fixed set of pipelines that you get. You can build your own pipelines the way you want. Right, so it's gonna take a minute before this uh, gets picked up. So I'm gonna actually show you like what happens if, for one of the ones that um, I already deployed a few minutes ago. What happens is basically, <coughs> Um, the stages are shown in green, it's basically the flat file got picked up, didn't validate, run transformation and set Azure table, and these are the steps that you see with respect to how each, for this particular workflow instance, how it got processed, right? And if you go to table storage, this is a step that I already did, so there's one uh, already existing, the last row was the one that I picked up earlier. So now let me actually go back and see the, uh, the one that I created right now is picked up. It's not yet picked up. So you get a picked up with, with a minute or two minutes time based on the trigger that I've configured. Right, you want to switch over? I can actually show you a little later uh, based on when it gets picked up. So there are formats. Right? Now there are multiple data formats which exist, which exist in the enterprise. Right. You have flat files that which are predominantly used by many systems, many of the legacy systems use flat files. SAP IDOC, for instance, is a perfect example of a flat file, very widely used. Even in the case of B2B and all, you have the protocol that, that relies on flat files. Then you have XML, which has been the backbone for a service-oriented architecture for a long time, and it's very widely used even today. And then how can we forget about JSON, right? I mean, most of the SaaS applications today uh, use JSON as a format. So what we provide as part of the platform is the ability to convert it into data formats, to various data formats. So with the flat file and XML, what we provide is a microservice that allows you to convert data, which could be in a flat file format, into an XML format, or vice versa, right? So if you have a message coming in, as a flat file, and you want to do the processing as XML or send it out into an XML to another system, you should be able to do that. And similarly, if you want to send a flat file out, you can also do that. Now, when you when you want to use a microservice that converts between a flat file into an XML, you need some way to describe what the data structure looks like, right? Flat file is when you could have like delimited, comma separated, you know, you, it has its own structure. So what we provide is we, we give you a tool that allows you to generate XML schemas for the flat file for which you want to convert into XML, okay? So this is a schema generation wizard. I, uh, I'm sure many of you have used the schema generation wizard in this talk where we provide similar functionality. You'll continue, you continue to, uh, to, you can use the, the same tool. We are going to provide a new with this tool that allows you to do all that. Similarly, between JSON and XML, we have a microservice that can convert data from JSON. So any JSON table that comes in, or you want to talk to an external system that, that, uh, that, is, that is expecting data in a JSON format, so you can do that, right? And you can do that, and we give you the ability to convert the data which is in JSON into XML, and XML into JSON, and vice versa. Again, here, you need a tool to sort of generate the XML schemas that you, want, that you may want. Uh, so we give you a tool that, that will allow you to create XML schemas given as specific JSON message instance. So the tool will just kick up and you can do that. So JSON has been one of the biggest impact that we have on this service today. So I'm happy to say that we will have 
maximum the ability to process this this one first class. Okay, so the next mediation capability is about validation. This is where you have an incoming message coming in, you want to validate and make sure that you filter all your unwanted data before you process the rest of the class, right? So typically you may have an invoice coming in, you want to make sure that, okay, it's really an invoice, so that you know, the rest of the class pays us to the data. So we give you a microservice again. So all of this capabilities, you get them as microservices that you can compose, just like how we have seen in the demo. That allows you to validate an incoming XML message given uh, against some XML schema, right? And we do the approach to support multiple XML schemas, which means that you can say, okay, these are the set of XML schemas that I'm interested in. Typically, when you have an endpoint, for instance, you may want you may want the ability to handle different types of messages. So you have different XML schemas that they define, and your validation microservice will be able to say. Whether it, whether it matches any of the uh, XML schemas, or if it matches which XML schema did it match, right? And you will be able to get all those data out. Now, when we talk about XML schemas, okay, one of the key, one of the key thing is we will we want to provide a first class experience for business users, right? So in the earlier session, we saw how you can how you can build your workflows, and even in the demo. Just so you can build a workflow using a web based workflow designer, right? So, similarly, we will have a web based uh, schema editor where, where you can, we can edit the schemas, we can create new schemas, you can view the logical structure of the schemas, you can export your schemas so that you can save it on your local disk, or you can upload it and you know, start editing it the same way. And you also have the ability to generate external instances and also validate whether a certain XML instance conforms to that schema or not, right? So this is this kind of new, uh, new direction tooling that we're building uh, for schema editor. The next uh, mediation capability that I want to talk about is about enrichment in this track. So if you remember the travel booking scenario in the previous session, Right. We have an employee who logs in into a travel, uh, travel portal and then he types as an employee name, the city, you know, he wants to book a flight from one city to another, so he gets certain details and he says, you know, book me this flight, right? So as part of the incoming message that comes in, okay, you want to do certain, you know, uh, spend with a check, right? But then, in order to do that, I mean, we, we said you need certain things, right? Who is the employee? So you have an employee ID that's coming in. It could be an email address, or it could be your employee ID number, right? So some IDs, so there are some interesting data in the payroll. And also you want to have some, some additional data around that particular employee, right? Like who is the manager, right? What is the pay level of that employee? Is, is he entitled for business class, right? So there, there are certain interesting data that comes in. So the part of identifying what the interesting data is is what we call as expired. And the part where you say, okay, given this interesting data, I want to augment, okay, with some richer information about the data, right? So there are many such scenarios. I'm just quoting one of the scenario is what we call as enrichment. So we support enrichment and extract using XPath query lookup which means if you have an external message coming in, you should be able to specify, uh, give an expat query, and we will be able to evaluate this, what is the value of that expat query based, based on the incoming message that comes in. So for instance, if your employee number or employee ID is deep inside your XML structure, you should be able to do that. We will also provide the ability to look up based on their basis. Okay. So these are the enrichment and extract capabilities. Next is budget, right? So in many scenarios, you have the, you have the necessity to batch messages and send it out. This is about handling composite messages. There are many such scenarios. Any line item in an Excel spreadsheet, for instance, could be could be an individual message, and you want to have you want to construct a big composite message out of that. So batching is where we say. You combine multiple messages into one big uh, composite message, right? So that could have 
have all those bars there. Now there could be a various various criteria on which you want to you want to compare, you want to create that data set. And it could be based on time. For instance, you may want to say it doesn't matter how many messages or how many messages that I'm handling, but I want to make sure that if you know every two hours, if I have a message, just send it out, right? Create a batch and send it out. Or it could be based on the number of messages. So if you have a flurry of messages coming in, you want you don't want to create a batch, for instance, that has more than like 100 messages, right? Or it could be based on the size of messages. This is if I have big messages coming in, large tons of data, okay? Batching is all about efficiency when you talk to a server system. So you may want to, you may want to consider based on the message size as well, right? So these are what we call as a batch release criteria. You should be able to do that. Now debatching is about handling a large message that has come in, which has multiple parts to multiple messages. So again, we'll provide a microservice that will allow you to debatch a big composite message into a set of unique low messages. Right? Now transformation. Now different systems, of course, have different data formats, right? The same data in different systems, they look different. For instance, a customer in a CRM system, your CRM system may be very different from the customer of the HSC in the SAP system or in ERP system, right? It's the same data, we're talking about the same customer, we're talking about the same objects, purchase order, sales order. So there are many entities, they can look different in different systems. This is where transformation comes in, right? And it's one of the key components for any, uh, any mediation. You can do transformation using a graphical UI tool, and we'll talk very briefly about what it is. But if you have your own custom XSLD, for instance, right? If you want to do an XML transformation and you have defined your own custom XSLD, you can bring that custom XSLD and you can also do the transformation uh, in the app, right? So we provide you a microservice that you can do that. We are also going to provide a web-based micro tool. So along the same lines about creating new experiences or easier experiences with us all based on the web, we are going to provide a web-based micro tool. So the focus here is on retaining the visual representation that you see that, is, that, is, that has been one of the key benefits of the platform. And also, we are also looking at enhancing the productivity of how we do the transformation, right? So, Using a web-based mapper tool, again, you'll be able to edit or create maps on the browser. And we will continue to have uh, out-of-the-box support for many of the common functions that you can do. Okay. So uh, here, I would like to take, uh, you know, walk you through what the user experience for the transformation of the web-based mapper tool that we have. So currently today, as you saw in the demo, we have all the backend systems working, running, okay? Uh, the UX is one part where we are still working on, okay, this is where you also like to get some feedback. So we also have our designer here uh, with us. His name is Kamansu. So he is, uh, he wanted to get some feedback on the user experience. So for this one, if you guys have any questions on the user experience, you would be more than willing to, you know, uh, do that, right? So this is the, you have seen uh, this is a forum where you can see the microservices. So what I have is a transform microservice. So there, so you can see a set of uh, properties all about the transform microservice that you have. The settings are there, but there are key components here that you can see here, right? One is the maps, and the other is the schema, right? So for a transform microservice, those are the two key artifacts, right? A map defines how you do the transformation. Schema defines what does the data structure look like, you know, about the data, data that you want to transform, right? So you click on a map, and this is where you will be able to see the list of maps. So here in this case, for instance, I don't have any map. I'm just going to show you, you know, an empty uh, microservice that you have just created. And then you can just click on add a map, and this is where you can give a name for the map that you, or name for the map that you want to create a brief description maybe, describe what the map is all about. And there are three fields over there. What is the source schema, the target schema, and the mapping that you want to import between those schemas. 
So click on the source schema, you will be able to see the list of schemas. So if you have uploaded the certain schemas, so you will be able to see all those schemas. Or if you want, you can add a new schema. Right? So you click on add new schema, and this gives you a couple of options where you can add those schemas. So you can, for instance, just upload the schema from your desk. So you just, if you have the schema on your file, you can just upload it. And you click on upload, and you should be able to see the schema that you just uploaded. Right? So same way, you can configure uh, the source schema, and you can configure the target schema. Right? So you want, now you want to define how to map, how should I do the mapping. So you click on the mapping, and this is where you see our new web-based uh, mapping tool. So on the left side of this blade, you can see the source schema. Right? On the right side, what you see is the target schema. Right? And the, doing the mapping is very simple. You can just do a drag and drop. So you can just drag from the source to the target and you say, okay, this is how I do the mapping. Right? You can sometimes the schema could be very big, so you may want to do some searching, so if you type something, it will highlight the matching nodes. So that allows you uh, to quickly find out okay a particular node that you are interested in. So you can also do that. And mappings are your know, not all mappings and transformation are the simple assignments, right? And you have to do, you have to use some sort of a function, like string concatenation, right? So what we provide is we'll continue to provide a set of common functions that you find in the sort of So we'll have string functions, we we'll have logical functions, arithmetic functions, and a bunch of functions that you can provide, right? So you should be able to click on the functions and define that map. And once you do that, say for instance, in this example, you define a concat, you can just use reference the field, which is on the source side, and you can do the mapping. Now if you have a complex function, what you can do is you also have you can also define an advanced mapping. So you click on advanced mapping and this is where you can see a new blade coming up where you can type the advanced functionality that you need. Right? So for approval. So this is how you can create those transformations, right? So this is something which is very familiar to many, many of the folks. If you have used Excel, this is how you do, you know, how you write all those uh, functions in Excel. It's very similar. And we also feel that this is also very productive to create a map, right? So you can directly use your keyboard, you can do all those mappings, okay? So this is this is the way you create a map. However, uh, one of the bi uh, biggest benefit of using a graphical user is, okay, I want to visually see how my map looks like, right? Because that has been one of the uh, good features that we have in this mapper. So for that, you click on what we call as a tool map, and whatever map that you have created, you should be able to see those things in between, right? So you can still continue to see there are mapping that we have done visually. So if you click on the node, for instance, you will continue to highlight the mappings for the specific nodes. Right? So, so this is, uh, so if you have, uh, here, so if you have loops, for instance, if you have constructs, right, recurring uh, line items in a board, right, so these are loops or recurring constructs. So you should be able to see those uh, constructs you know, the mapping for those constructs within the context of that loop as well, right? Okay, I'll just say one question because I'm going to get yeah. A question of, will this replace the two people mapper in one, and then how do you, can you unit test that and put that in source control and ALM and these things? Okay, uh, I'll come back to some of those questions. I'll answer, I'll certainly answer your question on that. Uh, let me just walk through the user experience while we're in the store so that you get, you get an idea about what it takes Okay, so Sam had a question on whether this is going to replace Visual Studio Map. So once you have created the map, you can see that the map is created right there on the droplet for you. So you can create as many maps as you want, and you should be able to delete the map, or you should be able to do some testing of the map. So I'm not going to show you the full UX for how this works. Okay, so 
the intent here is to just let you know that you're investing in creating a new web-based uh, transformation or mapper uh, for the platform, right? Okay. So this is what we said about mediation. We'll have data formats and conversion, so you can you can we will be really supporting data formats for flat file, JSON, and XML. So you will have validation, whether an XML controls an XML schemas, enrichment and extract, batching, and translation, right, with a graphical mapper tool in the browser. So now let's talk about connectors. So another key piece for EAI, as we said, apart from mediation, is the ability to connect to different systems. Right? So this so connectors provide connectivity to an external system, right? So external applications, they can talk different protocols, and they can talk uh, different, uh, they can have their own API, set of API, so this is where connectors normalizes and provides you an API that you can use and consume from your workflow. And we said sources are modeled as triggers, right? So the example would be to uh, the ability to fetch messages from various external systems, and instantiate workflows that trigger, so that's why we call them as triggers with the trigger and workflow integration, right? And we will have the ability, to, we, will have, we will have both push-based uh, triggers, which is like examples would be like HTTP, or listing at an HTTP endpoint, and, and then you have a client application which is pushing data to you. Or we also have the ability to support polling-based triggers, which is where you go and check whether there are messages on that external system. Example, one example we saw was around FTP. There are many such examples, right? We said destinations that are modeled as actions. So it's just about invoking any operation that the external service provides. You want to upload a file on an FTP, that's one example of an operation. You, you want to delete a file on FTP, that's also another operation. You want to download a file that's, that can also be modeled as an action, right? So there are a lot of actions uh, that a particular data microservice may provide. Right? There are multiple, typically there are multiple actions. So if you are talking about a connector like SQL, some of the actions could be, I want to insert a record into a table, I want to run a SQL query, I want to uh, delete a row in a table, and so on. Now, a key important component for when you're talking to an external system is how do I do the authentication? Now, the authentication could be very specific to the external system that you have, which, which would be implemented by connector, the specific connector microservice. For instance, FTP has its own way of authenticating, right? You and based on username and password, right? So similarly, uh, you could you could also have uh, OAuth based authentication. So many of the SaaS applications today, for instance, rely on OAuth as the authentication mechanism. So we will provide first class support for uh, OAuth as well. Interestingly, you know, because we have a common app platform based on microservices, I, I, I remember there were a couple of questions around security around microservices. So we have a talk coming up tomorrow where um, we will probably get more details around the security and how we authenticate microservices. But, but the key point is that a connector, because the connector is a microservice, will also have to take integration with Azure AD, right? The another key important aspect around connectivity is around patterns, right? Many of the systems that you are connecting to are on the premise today. The data is not raised to the cloud. There's a lot of data still on the premise. There could be a file shared where your uh, ERP system is dropping messages out from where you do not just want to integrate, right? So ERP systems could be on the on the on the, on the premise itself. There could be databases that you want to connect to. There could be human systems that you want to connect to. So there are many systems on the premise today. And we will have a first class support for connectors when you, um, when you talk to on premise. Because the connectors are based on microservices, it also means that you can, you can continue to leverage the uh, hybrid connectivity options that are provided in Azure today. Right? If you have uh, Azure VPN, you can do that if you have express routes, for instance, you can continue to use all those options, right? Okay, which connectors are we going to provide? I can just tell you that we'll have a rich set of connectors out of the box. 
Okay? There could be protocol servers, for instance, like FTP, ICTP, SFTP, POP3, SMTP. Uh, there could be enterprise applications, SQL, Oracle, SharePoint. And then there are a lot of SaaS applications, like currently Buzz is a blog, it's an example, Salesforce, Dynamics CRM, Dynamics AX. But 